Uh, okay, thanks very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to take part in this conference. Um, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, stochastic geometry of um, random functions and um, related isoparametric inequalities. Uh, this is joint work with Jesus Rubolo Bueno. And um, I have a small outline here. Essentially, I have two parts. Um, the plan is just to recall uh, some convexity inspired functional inequalities. Okay, so uh, things of uh, Brominkowski type and uh, functional versions like the Prekopa Landler inequality and then their dimensional forms, which are the, known as the Borel Brass Camp League inequalities. Okay, and then I want to talk about uh, viewing these uh, from a stochastic point of view, uh, sort of associating empirical or random objects, random functions, and asking. Uh, you know, what can be said for, for these stochastic objects um, in terms of associated functional inequalities and, and, and their stochastic versions? And what role does convexity play here? Okay, so, so that's the plan for the talk. And uh, I'm going to start just by recalling Ruminkowski inequality. So it says that for compact convex sets, K uh, and L and Rn, uh, the bars here are just, you know, the big measure. So the volume of the Minkowski sum of K plus L with such coefficients is, is at least as large as this, this geometric mean in terms of, of, uh, of lambda. And uh, the you know convexity here is not important. It's sort of parenthetical, but it will play a role later in the talk. So I'll, I'll just sort of keep it here. And um, it says that the volume as a functional with respect to Minkowski addition is logarithmically concave. And a functional version of this inequality is the prickle Landler inequality. And so I can formulate this in a similar way. Uh, I'll take integrable functions and again, Parenthetical, perhaps log concavity here will, will play more of a role later, but, but uh, as stated, I can, I can state it without this assumption. And typically it involves um, an assumption involving three functions, but I prefer to formulate it with two. And uh, I'll write it in terms of what I'll denote by star, and that's a supremal convolution. And so that's just the soup of, of such an expression where I, the argument here I've just decomposed as a, as a combination um, in terms of x and y. Okay, and so, so if the integrand satisfies this inequality, well, then the integrals themselves satisfy a similar inequality. And uh, this is, of course, an extension of the Brominkowski inequality, right? Uh, if I just take indicator functions uh, of convex bodies, right, k and l, then really what I'm writing here is the indicator function of the Minkowski sum, and uh, it's really just the Brominkowski inequality. And so it looks, you know, to be, to be more general, but there's... Uh, various senses in which you can sort of think about this exactly as a Brominkowski inequality. And, um, you know, I mean, they're sort of foundational principles in you know, functional inequalities rely on passing between sets and functions. But what I want to talk about is a more sort of geometry and views point of view, uh, which, which says that you can really think of this inequality as a marginal of a geometric inequality. Okay, and so, so what I'll do is uh, just sort of give two sample proofs of this and um, this is just to motivate, uh, you know, what's what's going to happen later in the stochastic setting. Okay, so so um, the first proof I want to recall is is uh, by Renat, um, seventy six. And so how how does he approach the prickle lines or inequality? Well, that's about let's let's for example, it's sufficient to prove it for log concave functions. Once I have that, I can approximate. And for log concave functions, let's write the functions as exponentials of convex functions, minus a convex function. So I have a, a phi and a psi, and uh, I will turn a supremal convolution into an infimal convolution. So star here is the supremal convolution and the box is an infimal convolution. And I define that simply by summing the epigraphs, right? So I will define this object by simply taking the associated coefficients for the epigraphs, and this will give me my new convex function. And why, why do we do that? Well, we turn an integral inequality to an inequality for sets, and the integral of our function f is simply the new measure. Right? I'm just pushing the, the measure, pushing for the measure under the graph of f on, onto the epigraph, and, and uh, if I do the change of variables, I get, I get exactly this identity with this measure. Okay, I just have the exponential function on, on, on fibers here. And uh, if I want to prove an inequality about the subconvolution, well, I'm going to prove something instead about the infimal convolution, but that's now exactly a sum. And then it boils down to a Brominkowski inequality exactly for, for, for this measure, which you can prove via your favorite tricks for, for proving a Brominkowski inequality, decomposing, etc. Okay, so, so that's one geometric way to look at this. And a related method is um, a method um, 
later. Um, um, for example, this is an example in, in a paper by, by Clartog in 2007, and, and the method was used previously for duality inequalities and, and other affine isoparametric inequalities. Uh, but the idea here is uh, uh, for a log concave function, I can write it as a limit of, of uh, functions that are S con or that have additional concavity properties. So for example, this I'm just trivially writing f as a, as a pointwise limit. But if I raise this function to the power one over r, I'm dealing with a concave function. And uh, you can think about concave functions really as marginals of uniform distributions on convex bodies in several ways. And so for example, you can associate to uh, a function such that when I raise it to a given power, right, I'll raise this to the power one over r, I'm going to call that s, then I have a concave function, and I generate this body of revolution, and my function then is simply a marginal, right, of a uniform measure on this body, right, exactly by, by definition, and when I integrate it, Right, I transform an integral identity into a volumetric one. Right, so I, I have a volume of some body of revolution, and now the the Prokopov-Einstein inequality involves some supremal convolution that has some geometric mean, and I'll approximate. They will approximate that mean by, uh, you know, an S mean, where S now is a positive parameter. It's going to go to zero, and you can define a variant of the convolution in such a way that the function right that that you define this way its body of revolution is exactly the minkowski sum with with these coefficients of of my functions g and f okay so again i i interpret the functions as marginals of uniform distributions on higher dimensional bodies and i really use the brominkowski inequality to 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 get the pre line inequality this way okay so this is also implicit in, in, in some other approaches here but i want to emphasize the geometric content of this Okay, so so that's two two ways to go about it, and uh, I also have the notion of uh, Bruns principle, right? I stated the Brominkowski inequality in a dimension dependent uh, independent form, and there's a dimension uh, version. I'll, I'll state it in terms of Bruns principle that the nth root of uh, the the volume of a body is is n minus one root is concave on its support. And there's a family of functional inequalities that refines this, known as the Borel Braskamp Lieb inequalities, which you can state in terms of this s mean. And so, so, so this uh, you can formulate in a similar way. I'm going to define uh, an S supremal convolution with this mean uh, m lambda s, and and the inequality uh, looks like this. Again, I there's no no um, uh, special assumption on f and g. It's just for integrable functions. Uh, but when they are um, you know, some power of them is concave, then this, this mean is really what I'm, I'm computing here, right? It's, it's computing powers of these things. And so um, the dimensional analog of this is, is the borel braskamp lieb inequalities. And uh, why I call it the dimensional form, it's just an easy exercise uh, to say that, okay, for a power of a function being concave, let's call it S concave if F to the S is concave when S is positive. When s is zero, we'll call it log concave, and when s is negative, it's uh, that it's s concave when f to the s is convex. And so it's just an exercise to say that when you have an s concave function, then then the marginal is also uh, you know enjoys concavity properties. And here here's the explicit dependence. And when s is zero, this is really just the marginal of a log concave is log concave, and this is really you know recovering uh, the same consequences of the Prokopov Einstein inequality. Okay, and uh, this is another sense in which I can see something about marginals. And uh, the approach of Renat is actually about the borel braskamp lieb inequalities. So, so his approach you know, had a transformation when you have log concave functions, but you can run the same story with powers of your function when you have concavity properties. Okay, So again, that's another geometric way of looking at this, this inequality. And uh, now what I want to talk about is um, uh, stochastic versions of isoparametric inequality. So, so I, I think uh, that this conference, right, I, I, I have, uh, this is about as long as I can go without introducing a model, a probabilistic model. And so what I've been working on with collaborators is uh, within, you know, stochastic geometry of convex sets, you can often associate uh, certain isoparametric inequalities and revisit isoparametric inequalities like the Brominkowski inequality from a stochastic point of view. And uh, this is this is what I want to say uh, next. Okay, so so let me um, 
recall a stochastic variant of the, or a stochastic version of the Brominkowski inequality. Sorry, my uh, iPad is a little sticky. Okay, so, so let's introduce the model. So uh, if I have a convex body K, I'm just gonna sample random uh, independent points uniformly distributed according to the normalized Lebesgue measure. And uh, the brackets here, I'm gonna denote uh, uh, the convex hull and sub N here means just an endpoint sample from K according to this density. Okay, now the Brominkowski inequality um, is about uh, Minkowski sums of sets. And so you can think about doing the Minkowski sum now of these random sets. And so the underlying measure here, right? This means an endpoint sample from K. This means an M point sample from, from a convex body L. And now I wanna take the Minkowski sum of those random sets, take the volume. This is now a random variable. I'll think about its distribution function. And what happens is that's, always dominates the distribution function when I do the same operations where I have Euclidean balls. Okay, so stars in this talk are gonna be symmetric objects. The, the star here just denotes a Euclidean ball uh, with the same volume as, as, as the respective set. And so the idea here is I have a body, I choose points, I take the convex hull, I do it in L, I take the convex hull, repeat the procedure now for balls of the same volume and take the Minkowski sum, take the volume, right? Then the distribution function of the random variable on the left dominates the one on the right, okay? And so, again, I am emphasizing a convex body here. And why that? Well, it really is a stochastic Brominkowski inequality when I have convex sets, because if you keep sampling, right, these points, uh, these objects will fill up their ambient bodies and you'll really converge to KL and the sum of the two balls. But in the limit, you're gonna see a deterministic inequality. And the right-hand side, now I have homothetic bodies and that's exactly the right-hand side of the Brominkowski inequality. So, so you can associate a certain random object with sets in the Brominkowski inequality and the dominance, right? And the inequality, it's not something that holds globally for, for the bodies themselves, but it holds locally. Right, the, the, the volume of the sum of the green regions dominates, right, the corresponding things on balls. Okay, so in this sense, when you add convexity to the picture, right, the Brominkowski inequality, somehow convexity is not really important, but when you have convexity, there's a stronger statement, it's of a stochastic type, and it's a dominance, a stochastic dominance for this random variable. Okay, so, so this is very much motivated by geometric probability, Sylvester's uh, four point problem. And I've just given some references here. These are typically about geometric mean values of, uh, of uh, convex bodies. And um, this sort of corresponds to just having one set. And okay, this is one, one, one example of, of combining sets. Okay, so let me stop and make sure uh, if, if there are any questions or anything, anyone wants to ask anything. Let me open the chat because if I miss a chat, then that's not okay. Okay, so um, this is um, something that follows from previous work with um, uh, Gregoris uh, uh, Powers as well. Uh, I didn't say it in the previous slide, but but its name is there. And um, there's a general result here about uh, multiple integral rearrangement inequalities. And uh, it has to do with linear images of convex sets under certain random matrices. Now these, ran these vectors I will sample independently according to some densities. They could be uniform measures on convex bodies, but they don't have to be. They can be things that are non-convex. But fundamentally I'm taking uh, an image of a convex set. So I'm dealing with convex objects, okay? So, so here I have a compact convex set in Rn. I have densities and then I have a, a matrix. And this notation simply means apply this matrix to this set. So take the set of all linear combinations where the coefficient vector comes from this set. And uh, the idea is to, to uh, deal with this, right? The, the underlying probability space here is just really some, some copies of Rn, right? And for, or, or for, for K and for L. And you can formulate these as multiple integral rearrangement inequalities and pass to symmetric objects, right? In the class of sets, I went from sets to balls, but I can really deal with functions and go to their symmetric decreasing rearrangements, just the functions that are equimeasurable and uh, radially decreasing. 
Okay, these inequalities will come later, but I want to just give a quick link to what, how do you get the Bruman-Kowski inequality. So, so that was an inequality that mixes two operations, uh, convex hull and Minkowski sum, right? And I do the same thing over here. And so, so how do you link that with linear images? Well, you want to mix two operations. So you intertwine these random operations by lifting to a higher dimensional uh, space and doing it deterministically. So what does this mean? I'm just going to take a piece of the simplex or the L1 ball and another one in a higher dimension. I glue them together and put all the randomness in one matrix. When I do the multiplication, I get exactly the Minkowski sum. And this is actually motivated by generating convex sets by other, other, other operations and, and you know, started with looking at inequalities you know, of Bruminkowski type, for example, in LP Bruminkowski theory. Okay, so, so what I wanna talk about now, that's sort of the backstory for sets. What happens for functions? Now, I wanna take the idea of uh, thinking about uh, functions as marginals, right? But I wanna run this empirically. So I wanna think about random points and associating certain uh, convex sets in a higher dimensional space as a means to generate a random function. Okay, so I take this the setting I had before. I have random points. They came from a density. Before I had random sets and I formed a linear image of a convex set that gave me a random convex set. Okay, and now I'm going to, instead of thinking about a linear image, I'm going to replace those points by certain sets, right? Maybe I'll take uh, disks in an orthogonal dimension, just like I did uh, with these bodies of revolution, right? Just like I mentioned. Now, you might also work in the epigraph or maybe in the hypograph, depends if your function is, you know, S concave or S positive or S negative, right? So, so associated to all these random points, I'm gonna attach an object and I will generate a convex set, okay? And I'm gonna think later about marginals of those. and. What do I mean by attach? Well, there's a formal mechanism of, you know, this sort of comes from the action of a linear operator, but there's a formal mechanism here of combining these things. And this is again, motivated by, by, by variants of uh, Bruminkowski type inequalities, LP versions. And the formal thing I need here is the notion of M summation. And this is uh, something introduced by Gardner, Hug and, and Weil. And uh, the, uh, idea here is formally you can take an M combination of sets. M here is just some, some set in Rn. And what it is, is just the set of linear combinations where the coefficients come from this M and I have the Xi, Xi in, 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 in sets K. So the upgrade here is you move from points to sets. Okay, so that's what I want to do. Uh, good. Now I'm going to give you a description of uh, this for a particular way of constructing a random log concave function. Okay, so give me an integrable function, look at its graph, and let's sample points under the graph. Okay, so now I don't have points just on the, the domain, but I add a height, and I can work with other measures, but let's take this for simplicity. And for that, I'm going to take the least log concave majorant, right? Now, there's various ways of writing this down, and uh, if you want, you can describe it in terms of coordinates. I'll just take representations of points x in the convex hull. Okay, it's going to be supported on the these points xi in the, the domain. And I'll take this certain geometric mean where I have these coefficients. And that, that this is this is one way of writing the least log concave major and above these points wi. Okay, it's supported on the convex hull and it's it's above that. Okay. And you can think about this once if I have a log concave function, I take the logarithm I'm in a convex region, and then I can take the convex hull of those points, take this surface, right, and then go back. Okay, so that's three descriptions of how you would define a least log concave majorant. Now, this is a random approximation of a log concave function. And uh, I do the same thing, not with the log, but with the power, you know, t to the s. And I do it for s concave, s positive, and s negative. And I won't write all the formulas, but you can take the least s concave majorant of these points or the greatest s concave minorant. Okay, so, so these admit similar descriptions. And now I want to talk about um, what happens in, in you know, inequalities like uh, the borel brass camp leave inequality, right? That involves some supremal convolution. Right, that was a way of writing writing the, the inequality, and I'm going to do this for random functions. Okay, so so now I think I've, I'm at the point where I can state what's what's the main result. I hope uh, all the sort of pieces are, are clear. Uh, and now the idea is that 
if you can view uh, inequalities for functions as marginals of geometric inequalities for sets, right? What happens if you trace this idea empirically, right? If Brun's principle is behind, you know, functional inequalities, right? Like the Borel Brass Camp Lieb inequalities, right? If you do this empirically, what does it mean for Brun's principle? Okay, so what it means is that Brun's principle also has a stochastic version, right? There's a stronger stochastic formulation of Brun's principles for some kind of S concave approximants where you will see a local dominance at every step of the way. And when you keep sampling, you will get back uh, a, a version of Brun's principle. Okay, so, so now I will link all the things I've said together. Uh, star, again, is this supremal convolution. It comes with a parameter S for S concave functions. I have suppressed the S in this thing just because the notation gets a bit unwieldy, but now I can state the main, main result. Okay, so, so what do I say? Here's a stochastic form of the dimensional form of Brun's principle and uh, give me integrable functions F and G, say they're S concave. S is uh, at least as large as this, this parameter. Then when I do this supremal convolution for random functions, right? And I do the same thing with the rearranged objects. Uh, every step of the way, I will have a kind of stochastic dominance, right, for the distribution functions. So, so in a picture, right, in you know the the borel brass camp lieb inequality is about taking the supremal convolution of f and g, and what I do here is I compare with the rearrangements. So. Um, when I do this, right, I am instead gonna do the supremal convolution with this random function, okay? I do this with the random function here. I do the same thing with the rearranged objects, right? And the dominance holds for the distribution function of this random variable, okay? In the limit, when you have S concave functions, you really see the borel brass camp lieb inequality because you get back uh, this functions, the F and G, okay? So again, that the, the non-random form, as concavity somehow played a role maybe in coming up with a way to prove it, but then you can dispense with it. But here as concavity plays a more of a role because I can actually approximate my functions and I see a stochastic dominance underlying the inequality. Okay, and what do I get back? I get back a refinement of the borel brass camp lieb inequality. So the borel brass camp lieb inequality compared this thing and this thing. And there's a strictly stronger version where you can always sandwich the rearrangement. Okay, this is on a non-random level. Okay, and what this inequality above says, this refinement, right, this strictly stronger version itself has a stronger version, right, stochastically. Okay, so, so there's a bit of baggage in the notation, but what it means is the idea of minimizing the integral of the supremal convolution of F and G, right, it holds sort of at a local random level. Okay, and, and when you approximate, you'll see the inequality. Okay, so, so that's the main, uh, result for the talk. And now I mentioned what happens for sets. And now we've sort of taken this point of view of thinking about inequalities for functions as marginals. And now uh, I want to say some something about, um, you know, what's what's needed uh, to, to prove this. And uh, I think, how much time do I have? I have... Uh, someone is muted, sorry, just to be sure I'm not missing the time. About five minutes. Five minutes, okay, thank you. Okay, let me stop because now we will uh, go into more technicalities. So, so questions about any of the notation, anything? Okay, so um, many of these inequalities, as I said, they depend on some form of symmetrization and uh, within geometric probability, you can view uh, symmetrization like Steiner symmetrization as a, as a special case of uh, linear parameter systems or shadow systems. And so here, um, this motivates actually a notion of shadow systems and uh, um, related things for, for S concave functions. Okay, so this is one ingredient that is sort of implicit in how, how we approach this. And so let me give just a definition of how, how this works when you move from sets to functions. So the idea here is if you fix uh, some bounded sets, xi and, and lambda i, these are just indexed by, by any given set here. Uh, if I take the convex hull of xi and I move all these points in a, in a given direction, then 
these enjoy a certain convexity property, namely that as I move the parameter, the volume of this is a, is a convex function. So this is a fundamental property proved by Rogers and Shepard. And uh, closely associated to this is a notion of a shadow system. So Shepard sort of reinterpreted this as you can recognize these things as projections of, of some convex set in a higher dimensional space. And as you project uh, parallel to a given uh, 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 vector, Okay, so I'm going to project parallel to this, and I've raised my, my set in, 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 in a dimension here. Uh, I can recognize all these things as projections of a higher dimensional convex set, and you can really re recognize these as shadows. Okay, and this is some fundamental method in proving, proving geometric inequalities. And uh, okay, I've given just a, some references here, but there are many others. And now what do I do for uh, S-concave functions? Well, I had a bounded set just so I could write down the volume. Now I have points. They're in some domain, they come with heights. I want them to be under some S concave integrable function so I can write its integral. But I run the same definitions I had at the random level for at least concave S concave major int or greatest S concave minor int according to the, the sign of this. And there's an exact analog of this property that I, I have a convexity of the volume movement where now I take uh, T Okay, these are the points I'm moving here. And I take the integral of the least S concave major and it enjoys a similar convexity property. Okay, so this is something about, um, you know, the idea here is if I wanted to symmetrize a given body and if I at some point saw my reflected body, right? If I know my function is convex and along the way I would see, for example, a, a, a body, its reflection, and then this the symmetrized body where all the, the midpoints are lying here, it's gonna say that this function will decrease right under the symmetrization operation, okay? So, so the same thing is happening for S concave functions and you can turn that one parameter convexity property into an n parameter convexity property for random vectors now, okay? And so I said, rearrangement inequalities are behind this. What kind? Well, if I use this terminology of I have a function of many arguments on Rn, I'll call it Steiner convex. If no matter what direction I pick and no matter what points I choose in the orthogonal complement of that direction, when I look at one, you know, the restriction of my function, to a common coordinate in each argument, if I get something that's even and quasi-convex, I'm in good shape in the sense that I can symmetrize. So what do I mean? So here's a version of the uh, inequality. Um, it's a formulation of the rogers braskamp lee Vladinger inequality as, as reformulated by Christ. And it says for such functions, you can integrate them against densities and pass to their symmetric decreasing rearrangements. Okay, so, so this is the key thing that's behind the inequalities for sets. And now what happens for functions? Well, the inequalities for sets, you need to verify that you have this property. Canonical example, right? What's your favorite example? Think about a determinant, which is multilinear in the rows and columns. But uh, that's something special, right? It's not the only example of a function which is going to have the Steiner convexity property, okay? And this is actually sort of implicit in many works in geometric probability for sets. And so Bussmann used this for determinants. That's why if you want to deal with random simplices and minimize it, because the determinant has this property, that's why you can continue. I have uh, one minute, I hope, if I can just finish this. Um, you can upgrade this to convex hulls, convex hulls of balls, uh, intrinsic volumes, of linear images of sets, there are many others. And the final ingredient here is that for this operation of constructing random functions, right? I did it using sets and combining segments, rays, disks, all of those correspond to constructions of random s concave functions. And all of those now have this Steiner convexity property. So, so these, right, I say for random S concave functions. And that's exactly because the two mechanisms I started with at the beginning allow you to uh, reduce volumetric quantities to now integrals of random concave functions. And for all the operations you could deal with for sets, you can now deal with for uh, random S concave functions. Okay, so, so this is, this is the, the end. I'll stop there. So 